Hi, welcome to part two of our 10 part series on the transformation of our suburban lot into an urban permaculture homestead. In this video, we talk about rainwater harvesting. In our backyard, we had a conventional terrace lawn. So we had a top terrace and we had a bottom terrace. And the, this lawn had been there for probably 30 years and was treated like every other lawn in the city. So it's cut, and fertilized, sprayed with Roundup. And over time, when you cut the lawn and spray it with these chemicals, what happens is the soil actually starts to compress and get compacted. So it gets really hard to grow things in there. And the other thing that happens with lawns is most lawns and landscapes around homes are designed to actually flow the water away from the house. And for good reason. We don't really want water concentrating around our basements and causing problems. But at the same time, when we, when we end up with these hyper-compacted soils that are designed to shed water away, we end up having these landscapes that require us to constantly be feeding water, usually in the form of sprinklers. And sprinklers do all sorts of bad things to our landscape, especially in these hyper-arid places. And I wouldn't say Calgary is necessarily hyper-arid, but it's definitely arid. Um, and number one, we're using water that comes from a river, so it's got lots of minerals in it. And number two, we're surface watering with sprinklers, which means that as the water evaporates, it's going to leave its minerals behind. And slowly those minerals will start to accumulate in the soil and they can cause problems. One of the first things that we did was we looked at how the water was moving off of that lawn and then we came in and we dug a swale. Now a swale is a water harvesting ditch on contour, which is kind of like the closest analogy that I can think of of a swale that, that will resonate probably with you is your bathtub. Most ditches when we design them within cities are actually designed on an angle, which means that when water falls on that ditch, it's actually going to uh, send the water away. A swale, on the other hand, is actually designed on contour, and so the water ends up staying there. And so if you think about your bathtub, when you turn the tap on on your bathtub, the water in the bathtub doesn't fill up on the front half and then spill over into the second half. The water fills up the bathtub all simultaneously because the bottom of that bathtub is level. So once there's a layer of water on the bottom of the bathtub, it slowly fills up consistently. So when we build water harvesting features in the landscape to slow that runoff that we all have to deal with in these cities, we build the bottom of this ditch dead level so that when a small amount of water goes in there, it spreads out evenly from one side to the other. And this ensures that we get a really even hydration all the way through the landscape. Number two, we usually connect these swales to water harvesting features like roofs, or um, other landscape features where there's wastewater coming in. So in this case, we connected this swale uh, to our roof, so it's actually harvesting rainwater, which is much better for the landscape than, than river water. And number three, um, the swale encourages the water to go deep into the ground, so there's no access to the to sun. So we get very little evaporation. And by hydrating lower levels in the soil strata, we end up encouraging the plant roots to go deep down to get that water, which makes the garden drought proof. So one of the unique things about the way that we've designed our garden is that it actually does not require any additional city water to keep it going all season long, even when we get into the dry season in August and September. And that's because we've, we're started, to, we've started to recharge the groundwater underneath the plants and those plants have worked really hard to get into those deeper layers where all that water is stored. The soil, in essence, is actually your cheapest rain tank. And it's actually really easy to turn a piece of compacted soil into something that is essentially a giant sponge to hold water. So what we did with the swale afterwards is we actually filled the trench with, uh, we put a weeping tile in there. And a weeping tile is a pipe with perforations all the way through it. And then we put gravel on top of that. Now I would not recommend gravel uh, anymore uh, as what happens to the gravel over time is it actually gets full of soil uh, and then the purpose of the swale or the functionality of the swale actually diminishes with time. Um, what we've ended up using now, which we find to be a little bit more effective, uh, is mulch. And mulch, um, 
slowly decomposes around this weeping tile and as it decomposes we can excavate the mulch out every three or four years and put that back onto the garden. So it ends up being a soil creation mechanism. And you'll notice that there's pathways wherever we had dug swales um, and you can kind of see that on the gravel there. And the pathways are designed to be about 12 to 14 inches wide and we have pathways uh, intersecting with our garden beds and our garden beds are always designed to be double arm reach no-till garden beds. So we can gain access to the garden without actually having to step onto it and all the hydration uh, and irrigation happens subsurface where our path is. So our water and our access are combined. And the beautiful thing about this is that because our garden beds are not designed to be too wide, we never actually have to step on the soil which stops it from getting compacted. So now we've got the hydration, we've got the access and we've got the garden bed all in one. And like I said in my last slide, this garden requires no additional water from the city. So we've actually disconnected it from the city. This is a really important point because most people don't realize that in cities, up to 30% of the city's energy budget, so the, the amount of money that the city spends on energy, specifically the city of Calgary, not all of its residents, but the city of Calgary itself, up to 30% of a city's energy budget can be spent pumping water to our homes and taking sewage away. So taking care of your water needs within your landscape can have a huge impact not only on the amount of water that we consume as individuals but on the amount of energy that is required to run a city. And if you look at Calgary as an area and you look at the amount of rainfall we receive annually what you realize is that we actually get enough rainfall coming in on an annual basis to meet all of our water needs despite the fact that we're actually uh, we, we use a ton of water as North Americans. One of the things that we set up right away was rainwater harvesting, specifically from the roof to the rain tank. And in the picture you'll see that I've got a thousand liter rain tote and then I've got an interesting connection with the downspouts. So my downspouts and, and all rainwater harvesting for that matter in my climate, because I live in a very cold climate, has to be set up for both the winter season and the summer season. So in the winter season, we have a diverter valve, which you can see at the top of the picture. And I can take that diverter valve and switch it over to one side, which sends all the water from the roof in the winter time during our Chinooks and our melt to the garden itself. So it doesn't go into the rain tank and freeze and cause problems. And then in the springtime, I can switch that diverter valve back over to the other side and the water will actually flow through what's called uh, a leaf eater and the leaf eater is essentially a screen with a 45 degree angle on it which harvests and, and keeps out any of the debris coming from the roof or from the, uh, the gutters and it, it ensures that that doesn't get into the rain tank and then from there the water flows down into a first flush diverter which takes the first flush of water off of the roof and diverts it and keeps that out of the tank as well. That first flush of water is going to be the dirtiest water and you don't really want that going into your rain tank. Once the first flush diverter is full, then all subsequent water goes into the rain tank, which is then stored for later use. Now the rain tank itself also has to have an overflow. And so the overflow comes out of the tank when the tank is full, and it flows into those swales that I just showed you in the last slide. This water that we hold back is only about a thousand liters for each tank. We have three of these on our property. But that's enough water for us to run a small drip irrigation system for our, our lettuce bed um, and also to have a backup supply of water. Now when you set up a rain tank with a first flush diverter and a rain head and you make sure that your gutters are clean, most people don't know this but you can actually harvest water off of asphalt roofs and have it clean enough that you can actually drink. Now last year in Calgary we had, in 2013, we had crazy floods in this city. And what was ironic about these floods is that we got so much water and so much debris into our river and our water treatment facilities were so overwhelmed that we actually got very close to having to shut down the water system here in Calgary. So we got all this water and yet we couldn't drink any of it or it was potentially going to be contaminated and we would have had to sanitize it. And here we were sitting with uh, probably four or five thousand liters of clean potable drinking water in these rain tanks that we could gain access to if we had to. 
There's a lot of cities in the Western world, Brisbane is the one that comes to mind first, but lots in California as well, that actually encourage their citizens to collect rainwater. Number one, it creates resilience, like I just talked about in situations of drought or in flood. Um, but number two, it takes an enormous amount of pressure off the water system and it reduces the overall energy consumed within the city. One of the last things that you need to do in your rain tank in order to ensure that the water is potable is you actually need to raise the pH. And one of the ways that you can do that is you can put limestone in the tank uh, and limestone can come either in the form of limestone or you can use a block of concrete or any kind of rock that, that will demineralize over time. And what that does is it actually remineralizes the water. One of the things about rainwater that, that um, we kind of have to deal with is there's a lack of minerals because it's basically distilled water. So it remineralizes the water, raises the pH, and any heavy metals or pollutants uh, that are soluble in acidic water precipitate out and are no longer in solution. So it's actually very easy to harvest rainwater and it's very easy to take a couple of extra inexpensive steps to harvest it in a way that makes the rainwater potable.